Okay, um, I think we are ready to start then. Um, so thanks everyone for joining us today. Um, welcome to the first in our new series of webinars on how to get published. Um, today we're going to be focusing on how to select the right academic journal, uh, academic journal for your article. Um, just so you're aware, we have enabled closed captions, but if you can't see it on your screen, you may need to enable it yourself. So there should be an option at the bottom of your screen uh, saying live transcript. And if you click on the arrow, there should be an option saying show subtitles. So if you need um, transcript, you can click on that. Um, so can we move on to the next slide, please? So today our speakers are, um, I'll start with Jessica Lepalski, who is publishing editor on the STM jur journals editorial team. Um, she manages a range of journals, working with editors and societies to develop new strategies and problem solve. During her time at Sage, she has also worked closely with the author team to create and develop resources to help early career researchers better understand the publishing process and publish their research. She is based at our Sage headquarters in California. Next, we have Lorianne Sarsfield, uh, who started at Sage Publishing six years ago as an editorial intern and has since moved on to her current role as publishing editor too. In addition to managing a portfolio of STM journals, she also works as Sage's global abstra uh, abstracting and indexing consultant. Lorianne graduated with a bachelor's of, uh, Bachelor of Arts in English and a minor in anthropology in 2013. Then we have Derek Fisher, PhD, um, who is the dep deputy editor of Clinical EEG in Neuroscience and is the chair and associate professor in the Department of Psychology at Mount St. Vincent University in Halifax, Canada. Dr. Fisher co-directs the EEG lab at the Mount ELM at Mount St. Vincent University. His research program uses brain-derived event-related potentials, ERPs, to investigate questions within the fields of cognitive and clinical neuroscience. His work has resulted in over 60 peer-reviewed publications in the areas of psychology, psychiatry, and neuroscience. Apart from his work with clinical EEG and neuroscience, Dr. Fisher has reviewed for over 40 journals. Then we have M Melissa Knott, who is an occupational therapist and instructor in, in occupational therapy and a PhD candidate in health and rehabilitation sciences at Western University in London, Canada. She is the associate editor for OT OTJR, Occupation, Participation and Health, and works extensively behind the scenes to support the editorial board members and authors and conduct outreach for graduate students and early career researchers on strategies to enhance success with publishing in peer-reviewed journals. Melissa has published research and presented at national and international conferences on fitness to drive and driving performance in at-risk populations across the lifespan. And finally, there's me, Maria Tissot. I am marketing manager in the author marketing team at SAGE, and my focus is on helping researchers who are in the early stages of their careers get published. I am based at SAGE's London's office. Next slide, please. Our session today will last about 40 minutes with 20 minutes reserved at the end for questions. If you have any questions, please use the Q&A function on Zoom and we will try to answer as many as we can. You can send your questions anytime and we'll read them at the end. If we are unable to answer your question, do not worry, we will follow up with you after the presentation. I will now hand over to Jessica. Thank you so much, Maria, for that wonderful introduction and a big welcome again to everyone here joining us for the How to Get Published webinar, the first in our series. So today, as you can see, this is an overview of the publishing process and the publishing journey, which is continually ongoing. Today, we're going to focus on how to choose the journal to which you would like to submit. So thank you all for being here. So as you've probably already been asking yourself, before you even get started, and as you conduct your research, it's important to think about who is going to be interested in the work that you're doing. How does it build on what we already know in your field? How significant or novel is your message? 
have you uh, focused on your data collection and your findings? Have you checked, double checked, and triple checked? Uh, maybe you're even working on a, a reproducibility study, and, and that's the focus of your research. Uh, maybe it's filling a gap or providing a theory extension, or maybe trying to correct uh, the current knowledge we have in the market today. So those types of questions are what you should be asking yourself already as you're embarking on your research journey. So as you're looking for a journal to submit to, as you know, there's thousands and thousands of journals out there, and there's many different factors in how to actually choose a journal. Uh, so many people will first look at reputation, but and that is absolutely important. Um, what is of the journals that you're continually reading and that your colleagues are submitting to and publishing in, uh, what is that reputation? Is it affiliated with a particular institution or a society that you might be a member of? Um, maybe it's independent, uh, but has uh, a fantastic editor or editorial board. So as you're going through these journals, uh, looking for transparency in the aims and scopes, looking for transparency in the people that sit on the editorial board, as well as the type of peer review that is conducted are some of the key factors. You'll also want to look at paper type. Um, if you're submitting original research, that might be fairly straightforward, but if you're working on a case report or a systematic review, you'll want to check to make sure that the journal that you're interested in submitting to actually accepts that type of paper. Um, some journals do or do not accept certain types, so it's so important to look at that. You can also um, look at your own reference list of the papers you listed and see if those might be a good fit. Oftentimes, the papers that you are citing might be good journals to which you can submit. You'll want to look at the type of peer review that is conducted. Um, so we'll have a whole separate webinar on how to navigate the peer review process as an author, but you'll want to look for the basics. Uh, does the journal operate with uh, single anonymous where the identity of the author is known to the reviewers, double anonymous where neither party knows one another, or maybe it's an open or transparent peer review policy in which everyone's identity is known. One of the big takeaways we want to emphasize here is looking at the readership. While many of many researchers want to publish in nature or science or JAMA, that, that, that's great, um, but you'll want to focus on the readership of a journal. So if you're looking at a more niche topic for your research, think about who is your end reader who is the end researcher that will ultimately be reading your paper and focus on journals that match that criteria. Just because you publish in a high impact title uh, that has a high impact factor does not necessarily mean that your paper will automatic, automatically receive a high number of citations. It's really dependent on your article, your research, and who is reading it. So really the two key takeaways that we want to emphasize is that looking at the aims and scope of the journal is crucial and thinking about the readership of the journal who will ultimately be that end user. I did mention some, some journals like Nature and Science. Thinking about acceptance rate as well is a, a key component for thinking about where you might want to get published. Um, some journals have a 5% acceptance rate due to the sheer number of submissions they receive on an annual basis. Other journals might have a 50% acceptance rate and many journals fall anywhere in between. While that number may not always be published, speaking with colleagues in your field and understanding their experience 
will be helpful to understand that uh, acceptance rate. And also thinking about the turnaround time. Maybe you have a deadline uh, by which you need to submit or publish uh, per your institution or your funding requirements. And not all of the time to first and final decisions are published, but many of those journals are transparent uh, in those metrics, and that might be a deciding factor. We'll have another webinar on this, so stay tuned, but uh, maybe your funder or institution is requiring you to publish open access. You'll want to look for a journal that's either hybrid, uh, allowing you to publish open access in a traditional subscription journal, or you might want to focus on publishing in a fully open access journal to meet those funder requirements. But then there's many options just publishing in a traditional subscription journal, and that is great. Focusing on that readership component might be that deciding factor. So really thinking about the big picture, what are your institution requirements, your funder requirements, and how does that tie in? Um, we'll be focusing on metrics and indexes here shortly, uh, but one of the key components for um, looking at reputable journals is seeing where they're indexed, uh, whether that might be the Directory of Open Access Journals in Scopus or the Emerging Sciences uh, Citation Index or Web of Science. Here at SAGE, we have what we call the Journal Recommender, and this is a tool where you can plug in your title uh, and abstract to help provide uh, potential journals that might be a good fit for you. I know other publishers have some services like this. So rely on your colleagues, your co-authors, um, your mentors, as well as uh, the publisher resources available to help determine the best journal for your fit. Uh, Melissa and Derek, I wanted to open it up to you to, to share a few tips that you might have as well. Melissa, do you wanna start? Uh, uh, sure, I will. Um, so thank you, Jessica. Those were some great uh, tips and um, I'm trying to think of things that I can add to it actually covered a number of the points that I was thinking. Um, one of the items that you actually just mentioned was um, turnaround time and some metrics and whether or not those are published online and where you might find them. Because um, I know that's something at our journal that we are intentionally very transparent about publishing. So some journals, you'll be able to find that on their journal homepage online. And they would post, you know, um, what is the turnaround time from when you submit to getting peer review done or to a first decision or to a final decision. And they may also have metrics around from the time it's accepted, how long until it's either online, like e-published ahead of print or assigned to a journal because those can have big impacts also. Um, and uh, other, our, other journals such as ours, we actually publish those every January in an editorial. We crunch the stats from the year prior and we keep a track over time in terms of impact factor, turnaround times, acceptance rates and so forth, so that it's easy to find. So if you can't find it on the webpage, maybe hunt for some editorials and see if they do mention it there, uh, hopefully on an annual basis, but it might not be there. <clears throat> and that considering things like in, in the balance, you know, putting it all together in terms of uh, what is the acceptance rate? Is it likely um, how well known is the journal, but also this aspect of turnaround time. Um, and, you know, it might be more beneficial to you in the kind of early career stages to look at something that maybe um, has that um, less delay in terms of the turnaround time or a more uh, generous, you know, acceptance rate and that sort of thing. And so just know that if you are um, trying to get in with some of those higher impact journals, they do get a ton of submissions. So if you do get that desk reject um, off the bat, that does not mean that your research isn't worthy. It's just that that journal is not a good fit and that you will find those journals that have a good fit in there. Um, and then otherwise, I was just thinking about um, scope uh, and aims of the journal. Um, if you're not sure, if you feel like your work is kind of on the fringes of that, um, don't hesitate to email. Um, either there would be a contact for someone like Jessica, who's a journal uh, editor, or sometimes one of the editorial um, members would have their addresses listed. So we get those inquiries all the time. <clears throat> just send the abstract and say, would this be of interest to your readership? And they would be able to give you the thumbs up or down um, at that stage. And that will save you a ton of time in terms of formatting for one specific journal. 
just to have that potential decline only because of scope, where you can then invest that time in formatting for a more appropriate journal. So um, don't be afraid to reach out and ask those questions. Yeah, and Derek? Yeah, I mean, uh, the aims and scope is, is what sort of came to mind for me immediately, because I know, you know, when we're looking at papers that are coming in, one of the, the biggest reasons why it's going to be rejected, not even sent out for peer review, is because it doesn't fit the scope of the journal. It's sort of outside, um, you know, what we are, what the journal is about, uh, and what we think the, the readership is going to be about. So, I think it's a great uh, suggestion to, if you're unsure, you know, oftentimes if I'm looking at a new journal, sometimes the aims and scope, you know, the statement itself is so dense as to not necessarily convey what it's about. Um, so I will often even just do a little bit of a search, uh, punch in some keywords that are related to my paper um, and see if there are paper, similar papers showing up in that journal. And if, you know, if I'm seeing a ton of sort of papers in a similar sort of theme or using similar methodology, that to me is a really good sign. Whereas, you know, sometimes it's, it's crickets. Uh, you punch it in. There's, there was one paper from 1988 that used a similar methodology. Well, it's probably um, not going to be a great fit. Um, and I, I think, you know, it, as far as, you know, when we think about what science is about in publishing papers, you know, it's not about a line on your CV. To me, science is a communal effort where we're, you know, incrementally advancing our knowledge. So aims and scope is really important, I think, as far as contributing to your field and knowing that the, the right people are going to see it. Because, you know, yes, everything is sort of online and searchable, but you know, I know for myself and, and probably a lot of people in this room, subscribe to table of contents and updates from particular journals. And, and you know, my inbox is only so, or my attention span is only so big, so I can't subscribe to them all. So I've, I've got sort of a core group of about 12 journals that I, I subscribe for updates from. So it means that if someone's publishing in those journals and it's related to the work I'm doing, I'm more likely to see that paper, um, to cite it in my future work, and to let it inform my future work, right? you know, maybe spark an idea, or if I'm, I'm sort of struggling with how to interpret some findings, and I see this paper come through, you, you know, then, then it has done its job of advancing science. Um, so I think being mindful from that perspective is a really um, important thing as well. And I just have one more comment to add. Um, when you have narrowed down, you maybe have two or three journals in mind and you're saying, these all seem appropriate, you know, within scope, doable, they're within my field, um, is to also consider the author guidelines at that point in terms of um, verifying, do they accept this type of research? So um, say, are you doing a systematic literature review versus, you know, primary research um, qualitative or mixed methods, you know, do, do they accept those pieces? But then also, given your type of research and given the word limits for that paper or that journal, or the limits, say, on figures and tables, do you feel like you'll be able to do your work justice at that journal? You know, right? So some journals, you know, they say their original um, article, original research articles are 3,500 words. Can you do that in 3,500 words or do you need 5,000? Um, and so let that kind of inform, right? So there's some types of methodologies that do need that longer word count. So especially getting into qualitative or mixed methods or systematic reviews, those tend to be wordier. So just think about the logistics of, am I gonna be able to say what I need to say and to convey you know, the importance and the impact and to do justice to my methodologies within this word limit? Yeah, and that's it for me. No, and it's a really timely example. We actually just in my lab had uh, an issue where we submitted to a 33,000 word limit journal uh, and, and paper didn't go through. But, but, you know, as we were looking afterwards, said, you know, there, there's some, there's a lot of nuance to this. Like you need to provide so much, you know, you need to provide context in order to really sort of get this. And in 3000 words, by the time you've got methods and results, I mean, you've got very little space for the context and intro and, and discussion. So I think that's a really um, important point. No, it definitely is. And especially with uh, best practice being to submit to only one journal at a time, it's important to do your homework up front and really put that time into selecting that right journal or top three, you know, and then say, okay, A, B, C uh, is, is where I'm going to go. No, thank you, Derek, Melissa. Those are fantastic tips. There we go. 
I'm going to pass it over to you, Lori, to talk a little bit about an indexing platforms and what that means as well and how that factors into your decision. Thank you, Jess. Um, so as was mentioned, um, when considering a journal to publish, you also want to consider its indexing status. Um, and on this slide, if, if we could, uh, thanks, if we could go back to the, um, so the one of the key indexing services that everyone, of course, is going to be paying a lot of attention to is Clarivate Analytics. So on this screen, it's the purple and green and black little symbol that's their, their icon, and um, they own the Web of Science and JCR report. So um, the JCR is updated once a year with the impact factors of those journals in the social citation, uh, social science citation index and the science citation index expanded. Um, and the journal citation indicators more recently, um, that metric was added last year for those journals in ESCI. Um, it is updated once a year in June. So we're actually um, coming up on that update pretty soon here um, and then reloaded with any corrections in October. So um, Web of Science uh, is the citation database that is continually updated and provides the data for J the JCR. Um, researchers publishing in journals that are indexed in the Social Science Citation Index, the Science Citation Index Expanded, or ESCI, the Emerging, Sci uh, the Emerging Sources Citation Index, or HCI, which is another of their flagships, which is the Arts and Humanities Citation Index, will have the citations to their articles recorded so that they can start building their own research metrics portfolio. Um, the process of getting indexed by Clarivate involves multiple checkpoints on research quality. So being indexed in SSCI, SCIE, ESCI, or HCI is a positive indicator for that journal's um, editorial process. Um, and uh, Clarivate indexes journals in all subject areas. So um, any journal could theoretically um, be admitted to one of these indexing databases. Um, PubMed is the umbrella that you see there. Um, and uh, this uh, visual hopefully helps kind of explain the differences between uh, these terms. It's a government run biomedical index. And you can think of it, uh, of the word PubMed itself like an umbrella that contains both Medline and PubMed Central. Um, so although these are separate from each other, um, Medline is hosted exclusively on PubMed and PMC content is hosted on a separate site and then fed through to PubMed for hosting there as well. So they both wind up on the same platform. Um, PubMed does not provide um, citation metrics. Um, they, it is a free and highly credible indexing database and their focus is more on the research quality. Um, so, so it is a go-to place for biomedical researchers to find articles. Um, because of this, it offers uh, very high discoverability for those journals in that field. Um, and you know, all, all authors, potential authors have access to it. Um, so it has a very rigorous uh, scientific and ethical quality review for all journals. Um, it is quite difficult uh, to get into either index, but Medline especially. Um, and so being indexed in one of these is a positive indicator of a journal's scientific quality and integrity. Um, and then just as some historical context, Medline is an older index associated with PubMed um, that feeds into a little bit of why uh, they're highly selective. Um, and they will index articles while they are published online ahead of print. Um, PMC is a more recent addition to the PubMed portfolio and was created when open access started to become a more, uh, more popular publication model. So unlike most ANI services, PMC allows viewers to read the full text of an article that is indexed there. Um, usually that's more of a licensing aggregator uh, element rather than an ANI element, but PMC is an exception. Um, so these articles are placed under an embargo um, for up to 12 months though. Um, for researchers publishing government funded research, there's often a mandate to make that content available um, in its accepted pre-publication format. So if you're publishing in a journal that is indexed by PMC, this will be done for you automatically. Um, if you're publishing it in a journal that is not in PMC, you can still do this. You just have to manually upload, upload your manuscript through NIHMS. Um, and it's a relatively simple process. Um, you just go, you know, create an account, log in and um, upload your paper. So um, Scopus is uh, like Scopus, it's uh, 
or sorry, let Clarivate Scopus index this content in a database that's regularly updated and then produces annual metric supports. So some examples, um, the older example is the Simago scores and uh, more recently the site score as well is, is a metric that they provide. Um, so they do review journals for the presence of ethical policies and clear and a clearly stated peer review process. Um, so they, they do have an, another element of scientific quality review. Um, they do have a higher acceptance rate um, than some of the more selective indexes, but they do take a look at these things. So um, EBSCO and ProQuest are both aggregators that display um, full text and um, they cover a broad range of subject categories. Uh, I should mention, mention too, Scopus is also a broad range of subject categories. It's not specific to any field. Um, but there, uh, we also have exclusive indexing agreements with both with um, both of those services, so they can be full text aggregators or they can be indexing services. So um, Eric is uh, government run and specific to the education subject area, so a very a valuable index for a journal to be in if you're publishing in education and you want your research to um, reach other people in the education field. Um, it's a trusted resource. Um, they do have a quali a scientific quality review as part of their indexing process. Um, and it can also be a repository for government funded research. Um, so that's an excellent, um, an excellent thing to look out for if you're in education. Um, psych info, similarly, it's specific to the psychology, psychiatry field of study. Um, it provides excellent discoverability for journals and authors in those areas and is another trusted um, space and resource. Um, and then DOAJ is exclusively for open access journals. Um, so GOLT fully open access um, journals and has an excellent review and screening process for journals applying to be indexed. So if you are looking for a safe open access journal to publish in, um, if it's in DOAJ, that is a good indicator of the, of the journal's quality and that it's a safe space for your manuscript to go to because they do have that quality review as well. So we could go ahead and go to the next slide. Thank you. Um, so we, I mentioned before uh, Clarivate Analytic, Analytics and how they published the JCR, um, which um, includes the impact factor metric. So if a journal is in the Social Science Citation Index, or in the Science Citation Index expanded, then it gets an impact factor. Um, so journals in AHCI and ESCI do not receive impact factors, although their citations can contribute to that metric. Um, so we, of course, journals in AHCI and ESCI now have the new metric I mentioned, which is the journal citation indicator, but only SSCI and SCIE um, include the impact factor as part of being indexed. Um, so we have here kind of how the impact factor equation works. It's an average um, related to the number of citations in our, uh, per article in the last year. Um, uh, citations to our articles made in the uh, last year to um, items published in the prior two years. So you can see the breakdown here. Um, and then I also wanted to, there, the impact factor is a kind of controversial metric and there are a lot of thoughts on it. Um, it's undeniably important to the um, to the scholarly field, but I wanted to pause here and give um, Derek a chance to give a researcher perspective on it. Yeah, I mean, I, I've got a couple of, of sort of thoughts on the impact factor. I mean, firstly, recognizing that that there are some institutions that require publication at a, you know, in journals of a certain impact factor. Um, increasingly, we're seeing that going away. Um, the new DORA principle that a lot of institutions have signed on to um, sort of recognizes that the bibliometrics um, have their place, but they're not all there is to it uh, when assessing research quality and, and uh, an individual's research contribution. Um, so I wouldn't necessarily be governed so much by that. Um, but again, it sort of comes back to what I was talking about before, which is to say, if you've got a piece of research the, the main goal should be to, you know, that communal aspect of science and, and how do we contribute to science? How do we contribute to, to our understanding of this topic? And impact factor 
can sort of help guide you, but but sometimes, you know, the best place for your journal, or sorry, best place for your paper isn't necessarily the highest impact factor journal. It might be a journal with a lower impact factor, but um, that covers a very specific area. That's a really perfect fit um, for that, that piece of research. So I think, you know, not necessarily being overly swayed, um, and then coming back to where impact factor can be important for choosing a journal, to be honest, where I tend to use it is I think of impact factor as, as being predictive of, um, you know, whether uh, the paper is going to get a desk reject or whether or not it's going to go through. And so to me, higher impact factor journals, the papers that are going to go through there need to have a significant impact on the field. Right, they they need to be really novel. They need to be either um, countering a, a you know an established narrative in the field. So if if what you're doing represents sort of more incremental advancement of science or understanding in the field, a super high impact factor journal is not necessarily going to be the place for that. Right, it, it, they're looking for something that's really going to be very novel. Um, it, and that's okay. It doesn't mean that the, the work isn't good. It doesn't mean that the manuscript isn't of a high quality. Um, it's just, you know, aimed at sort of a different uh, area and it's going to be relevant to maybe support established knowledge, maybe again, provide some nuance uh, to what we know. And that's where a lower impact factor journal actually can end up being a much better place um, for research. And so, you know, as much as you know, impact factor has its place. I, I, I just want to make the point that it's not the only thing and it shouldn't be the only factor in determining, um, you know, the, the best place for your research because oftentimes the lower impact factor journals or mid-range, you know, um, can be a really, really great spot as far as getting your work out there. Absolutely. Thank you, Derek. And I, to that point, I also wanted to mention that, you um, in terms of you know the scope of, of your audience and who you're trying to reach, um, one common thing we see is that you know um, citation trends, for example, might be lower in a journal that's focused on practitioners, but what you're publishing may be helpful to practitioners specifically. So you might want to publish in one of those journals, even if it has a lower impact factor, because that's who you're trying to reach. Um, so you know there's a lot of things to consider with that, um, but undeniably it's a metric that's um, very commonly used in the in the academic world. So there's a there's a lot of nuances to it for sure. Um, so if we could go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, so another another metric I just wanted to touch on, um, it's very similar to the impact factor is the site score. Um, so I mentioned that's a metric that's produced by Scopus. It's a little bit newer and like the impact factor, it's an unweighted average. Um, so the calculation is done with a broad, a broader range of citing and cited years and includes all the document types in the denominator rather, rather than um, averaging with articles and reviews uh, specifically. So that's another metric you can look out for, um, like with a journal in Web of Science, a journal in Scopus will um, track the citation metrics of the articles published in it, so you'll also be able to track your own citations through that index um, if you have access to it and, and kind of create your citation profile that way. Um, next slide. So in case you're curious, um, we have uh, on any of our journal pages, um, we have the definitions of all of these different metrics provided. So if a journal has a metric, um, it will show up on our indexing and metrics page, and the definition of that metric will show up as well. So you can take the time to read through what each of these mean, but what's listed here is a lot of the common um, indexing metrics that you would see on those pages. Thank you, Laurie. No, that's uh, very helpful and, and great to know. Um, and just, just to add that it might take time for citations to accrue in a particular area. So while Impact Factor looks at citations in one given year to articles published in the past two years, uh, maybe the work that you're doing will take more time for those citations to accumulate, or it might be more practitioner focused. So no, all great Absolutely. points. Absolutely. Yeah, um, I, I would say that generally, um, that time frame 
um, it indicates sort of the time it takes for an article to maybe reach its peak um, citation rate. So it usually will take a year or two for you to start seeing citations coming in. You might see some the same year, but that's a little that's a little bit more unusual or rare. So um, be patient, give it time. And just so you know, these slides will be circulated for your review. So if you didn't get a chance to read all the definitions on the last slide, don't worry, you'll you'll see it posted. Um, just wanted to quickly touch on uh, open access at Sage. We did mention this was an option. So open access has been around quite a long time here at Sage. Uh, we were a founding board member of OASPA in 2008. Sage Open, who you might be familiar with, uh, was our first broad spectrum open access journal in social and behavioral sciences that launched in 2010. And now we publish over 180 gold open access journal that are considered fully open access. Um, and we also offer uh, hybrid open access through our Sage Choice program. Many other publishers offer this as well, where you can publish open access in a traditional subscription journal. Plus, we are now up to 19. So uh, that was actually, I made these slides a couple of weeks ago, and now we're up to 19, uh, what we call open access transformative agreements with consortia around the world, including countries like uh, Canada, UK, and the Netherlands. Um, but to remind everyone, I know we get so many questions around reuse, and we'll have a future webinar on this specifically, but you can share the original submission or the accepted manuscript at any time and in any format. So um, really, depending on the best fit for your uh, manuscript, whether that's a traditional subscription journal or fully open access, uh, we do have these author reuse rights. Um, the final published PDF is where you might have some uh, limitations, but in relation to your own teaching or sharing with colleagues, maybe using it in a dissertation or a thesis, uh, there are different uh, reuse permissions that you can do with that final PDF published version. This is all online. The links will be circulated after for you. Um, and then if you publish open access with that CCBY license, depending if there's anything extra like NC or uh, no commercial, um, you have the ability to reuse that as well. Going forward, uh, for sake of time, so we can leave time for questions. Um, Melissa and Derek talked on this. The, the, if there's nothing you take away from this other than <laughs> what we're about to say here, be sure to read the AMSON scope and follow the manuscript submission guidelines. Um, that's one of the biggest things we hear from editors is that you know they didn't read the AMSON scope or it was out of scope or it wasn't formatted according to the journal requirements. So be sure to check online uh, for those guidelines as you're formatting your work for that journal. Um, make every effort, as I'm sure you're already doing, to improve the quality of your manuscript. Uh, we offer um, English language editing services at SAGE through our SAGE author services, but you can also engage your co-authors and your colleagues and your mentors to help improve that quality. Be sure to declare any uh, funding, any conflicts of interest, and any ethical statements. There's the Equator Network that has a great checklist for, depending on the research style um, that you've conducted to make sure you're following all of the appropriate procedures and de declarations, and then abiding by any relevant research ethics, whether that's uh, patient consent, uh, what have you. And then being objective, uh, we've said it multiple times today, even if you get a desk reject, um, it may not be, a you know, it, it's not necessarily a reflection of your work itself. It could be the number of submission a journal receives, it could be out of scope, but then it could be maybe you've received some uh, feedback from the editor, you can take that to heart, um, maybe make some adjustments or revisions before going to submit to another journal. We have a submission checklist on the Sage Journal site, as do many journals itself them specifically in their author guidelines. So looking at word limits, the article structure, the reference style, um, how should the title, the 
abstract the keywords be uh, structured um, make sure your figures and label labels are uh, clear and as you're uploading your documents um, be sure to remove you might need to end up uploading two different files uh, one to facilitate anonymous peer review you might need to prepare a cover letter and you'll want to make sure to attain all permission for any copyrighted material and disclose that you may even consider supplemental data so maybe there's a word limit or figure limit you could upload additional figures and supplementary materials or you could upload audio files video files assuming you have all the appropriate permissions to enhance uh, that aspect of your journal article so we will have additional webinars and guidance on it. Part of this series is that we really wanted to make sure to dig deeper into all of the questions that you've had. So once again, common mistakes to avoid, make sure your tables and figures and uh, document is formatted correctly, it's out of scope. Maybe the, the journal does not accept their particular manuscript um, and checking to make sure that it's readable. Um, it, it, the copy editing team at the publisher will go through and provide some copy editing, but they will not change your author voice. Um, so making sure that you've done any um, heavy editing up front. Best practice is to submit to one journal at a time. Follow the submission guidelines in the platform that uh, the journal uses. Here at Sage, we use SageTrack, which is powered by Scholar One manuscripts. And then you can follow the steps in the platform. I'm going to pause here. Derek and Melissa, is there anything that you wanted to add about the submission process briefly? Uh, I'll just echo the comment around the author's guidelines. So these are absolutely your best friend and um, do you take them to heart. So you know when you submit, you'll have people like me on the other end uh, going through it. And so I'd say at my journal, probably 90% are sent back to the uh, authors on first submission because they fail to meet some aspect of the author's guideline and we can't send it out for peer review until we know that it fits. So um, that's just double checking things like, is the word limit um, so many pages or so many words? And is that from the introduction to the end of your actual narrative, your writing, or is that from introduction to the end of your references? Because that's a big difference if you're having to include uh, potentially, you know, five or six pages of references or a couple of thousand words there. Um, so just making sure you clearly understand what you're going to do up front and take the time, invest the time to get it um, properly submitted, because otherwise it will get sent back to you and that will cause incremental delays. Um, in terms of adding on those times, time sitting with us to look at it, time emailing back to you and so forth. And Jessica made a comment around um, checklists for Equator Network. So equator-network.org is a great resource in terms of um, the kind of research that you are working on. Um, are you, they have journal article reporting standards for a number of different kinds. And they do have these checklists that you can follow and then you can upload those as a supplementary document to basically help the reviewers see how rigorous your work is and that you are following best practice guidelines. That's actually gonna make your review go really much more smoothly because you know by following those checklists what the reviewers are looking for in the end. So that'll help things be smoother, fewer rounds of revision. Derek? No, other than my my 100% endorsement of everything you just said. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you both. Um, so before we go into the Q&A, just a, a little plug for our upcoming and next webinar. Uh, this will be focused specifically on how to write an academic manuscript. So giving deeper guidance on structuring your research, how to improve it, items you want to include, and then also thinking about handling those revisions or how to minimize the number of revisions. And then going forward, uh, we have uh, in-depth sessions on mentorship, navigating the peer review process as an author, open access specifically and author rights, and how to promote your article and increase citations with the series continuing into 2023. 
So with that, uh, we'd like to open it up to questions. I'm going to pass it to you, Maria, and we'll be circulating the slide here uh, so you can view all of the Sage Journal author resources that will really help you um, as you continue to dive into your publishing journey. Thanks, everyone. Thank you uh, to our speakers today for this very informative presentation. Um, we had quite a few questions uh, from the audience, so I will start with uh, the ones that have been the most upvoted. <laughs> um, so I'll just open this to uh, all speakers. Um, is how old is my research another factor to consider in choosing a journal? I have research from 2019, for example. At what point is data too old to publish? I mean, I would, uh, 2019 definitely is, uh, depending on, you know, I, I mean, uh, if, it, if it's tied to a very particular sort of event and a lot has been written and said on it, then it might be too old. But, you know, if, it, if it's something sort of general, um, so long as you think the phenomenon under study is still relevant, I would say that's fair game. Uh, I know in my lab, we, we end up with backlogs of data uh, we're, we're analyzing we actually just finalized a manuscript we're going to be sending out uh, this week that was collected in 2018 um, so you know I, I 2019 is fine and, and so long as it's still relevant today I would just add to that given the type of article so say you're doing a systematic literature review or scoping review or something like that um, typically they want it within like the last year or so yeah. for recency and relevancy because you're trying to capture all of the data within a certain time frame on this topic so if that's the case where that systematic literature reviews conducted in 2019. Um, what all, you, you don't have to throw the whole thing out. All you need to do is to run searches from 2019 to today, and then see if there's any more relevant articles that are published and then just add to it. So I've done that before where yeah. by the time you do it and it works through, you need to do a little update of one year. You might find one or two more articles and you're just gonna revise that and update it and you are good to go. Yeah. That sounds great. Um, thank you both. Um, the next question is actually a two-part question uh, from David. Um, do you need to be part of an academic institution, um, a university, to have manuscript submissions published? How do non-academics answer the ethics committee question during the submission process? I can so start. You go I, ahead, I, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll start and maybe you can chime in, Derek. Um, so, you do not necessarily need to be part of an institution to publish a manuscript. Uh, there are many people from industry and companies and government that will publish and co-author manuscripts. Um, in terms of declarations uh, and ethics, it's really discipline dependent. And so looking at the Equator Network for those checklists and guides will be a really big help. Um, even if it's sometimes it's based on the country in which you're conducting the research. So um, in some countries, maybe there's not ethical approval required for certain components, and you would still declare that. Uh, and you'll say that no IRB was required, or uh, but you have to provide some kind of uh, support for that. So looking at the Equator Network, um, and looking at the best practices within your discipline is a good place to start. Uh, Derek, Melissa, Laurie, anything I, you want to add? No, I mean, other than to say, you know, I think it depends on the type of paper too, right? It, it's, if it's a commentary, if it's a review um, that doesn't necessarily require ethics, that's obviously much easier than if it's data collection with human subjects, um, where that's typically going to require some sort of eth institutional ethics prior to data collection. Um, so not to say it can't be done, but then usually it would be done in collaboration with other partners at an institution with access to a research ethics board or an institutional review board of some sort. Um, thank you uh, for that. That's great. Um, the next question here is um, about multidisciplinary uh, work. So, um, what what is your uh, recommendation for uh, people with uh, work that covers a few areas so it doesn't quite fit one particular journal? Yeah, I can I can start with that. Um, 
there are some journals that will cross disciplines. And uh, so that's where doing that upfront research will come in handy. Um, some journals will uh, work with many disciplines just on its own, and that will typically be disclosed in the AMS and scope or within the author guidelines on the type of research uh, accepted. Um, and then also in that case, I would also rely on your colleagues, co-authors um, to, to see what they would recommend. So if you're collaborating with people from across the globe, asking, you know, where do you normally submit and then checking that journal to see would it still be a good fit. Uh, but yes, there are many options. I, I don't know if anyone wants to add anything. Yeah, I would say even just if it is multidisciplinary, it doesn't, um, it doesn't mean that it couldn't fit one of those disciplines. It might be just being thoughtful around how are you framing it? Like um, given the question and the data collection, like how are you framing your take on that to meet the scope of that journal? And how does your work advance the aims of that journal? And so just thinking about when you're crafting like the implications or some of the literature that you're citing to really situate your work, um, that you can probably take the same research question or very similar research question or data collection and kind of um, frame it to kind of point in different directions to suit your audience. So that would just be something to think about up front when you're doing it. You know, we are going to target journal ABC. Uh, and, you know, if, if this is our first one, if it's not going to work there, then these are our backups, um, just so you're knowing how to target the audience. Yeah. yeah. Um, thanks, everyone. Um, there is a question here. Is it mandatory to cite papers published by the journal I am targeting to submit my paper? Uh, I saw that. I've never seen that. Um, I mean, oftentimes it's a, it's a good, you know, if, if you're, it doesn't have to be that particular journal, but if, if all your citations are coming from very different journals, then I think that could be a red flag that maybe this may not be the best fit for your paper. But you know, if it's, if you're citing journals in the same field, um, totally fine. I, I've never seen, you know, a mandatory um, citation guideline. No, it's, it's, yeah, it's not required. Um, and I think editors and editorial teams will look to see are the journals that they cite relevant, um, whether that be the same journal or another journal in the discipline or related to that research. So no, it's, it's, it's not mandatory. Um, I think we have time for a couple more questions. Um, so if I publish with you as a preprint one of my manuscripts, can I still submit it as unpublished to one of your journals? Yeah, so I can take that one. Um, so yes, you. The, the short answer is yes. The longer answer um, is it can depend slightly. Some journals do not accept preprints uh, submissions, and so that will be outlined in the author guidelines. Uh, it will be stated very clearly whether or not a journal accepts preprints or not. Um, in general, though, the industry does not feel that uh, there's any red flags there. Um, just be aware that if a journal does have double anonymous peer review, that your identity might be known if someone is searching online um, for potential relevant research, your, your preprint might pop up. So just be aware of that. Um, one more question here. Um, what distinguishes an article published in JCR? Why are institutions so obsessed that publications should be within the JCR? I'll go ahead and, and address this one. And it kind of goes back to what we were saying before about the impact factor, which is that um, it's because it's a very old metric and it's you know relatively straightforward in that it's a citation average, it's become sort of the a golden metric for the academic world. Um, which it, it's important to it's important to consider that you know a citation average only measures one kind of attention to an article. I think one of the one of the reasons that it's you know besides just the fact that it's one it's um, 
a, a very old and trusted metric. I think that one of the one of the things too is the fact that a journal has to go through a very rigorous review to be indexed in um, Web of Science and especially in the flagship indexes like SSCI and SCIE that um, will give a journal an impact factor. So um, that's part of it is just that the journal has been through a quality review and then if it's receiving a lot of citation attention, then you know that is one kind of attention that the journal's receiving. It's reaching a broad audience in that way. So um, I, that, that's partly why you know it's it's become the golden metric that it is. Um, but again, you know, downloads are another form of attention, and it, you know, especially depending on your audience, audience, that may be the form of attention that um, is more relevant. Um, again, going back to my point about practitioners and the fact that for practitioner journals, they're probably going to see a lot of downloads, but maybe not as many citations. They're still accomplishing their purpose and making a difference in the world, you know. So um, it's 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 a big um, it's a big metric, partly just because of its longstanding status, um, because it does they do have a quality review. They do. Um, measure citations, um, which is an important form of attention in the academic world. But again, it um, there's there is a lot of nuance to it. It's important to keep that in mind. If I could ask, answer the second part of the question, then as to why are you know why are institutions obsessed with JCR? Um, you know, I, I'm thinking of it from the perspective of um, like uh, I've sat on a number of tenure and promotion committees, um, and, and there are journals out there that range from being downright predatory um, to you know I've, I've heard the term vanity journals, uh, which is say that the the peer review just isn't as rigorous. Um, and so I think if people are publishing in, in journals that are in the JCR, um, it, that's often used for better or for worse as a shorthand for the rigor of the peer review. Um, so if you're publishing in those sorts of journals, that, that indicates that the work is, a, is likely of a certain quality. Um, now, obviously, the, the better bet would be to go just read the paper itself and, and, and uh, judge quality. So it's often used, though, institutionally as, as a bit of a shorthand um, for quality. Um, so that would be one reason why so research institutions, universities, colleges um, like to see publication in those types of journals. That sounds great. Um, we've got time for one last question, I think. Um, so very quickly, um, what are the best ways to uh, identify predatory um, journals? So just in case, uh, we will have a, a specific webinar on this, so stay tuned. Um, but some of the short things you can look for, um, look at transparency, that's the number one component. Uh, a, a reputable journal will have uh, very transparent author guidelines, peer review processes, editorial board members and staff, uh, but then also looking at spelling, uh, grammar, um, and the publisher. Um, looking to see what publisher sits behind that. And if a journal is self-published, self that's totally fine. Uh, there are societies and institutions that self-publish journals, but looking for that uh, brand recognition. And then also doing a quick scan of indexes that Lurianne mentioned, um, looking in Scopus, Directory of Open Access Journals, uh, Web of Science, what have you, to see where those journals might be indexed, even if they don't have a site score or impact factor metric. That's great. I think that's all the time we have today. Oh, sorry, go there. Can I just add, unless Melissa, do you have, do you have any other uh, tips of how to identify? Pro I mean, so yeah, all those things. The, the other thing too is, I mean, anything that's, that's offering to publish you within a week, um, if it's that quick a turnaround time, that, I mean, peer review just doesn't happen that quickly. Um, or if they're inviting you to publish in an area that you have nothing to do with. I've been, uh, I received a recently an, um, an invitation to publish in a journal of osteopathy. I, I couldn't even tell you what osteopathy actually is. Um, so probably not super legit. Certainly, yeah. You will get advertisements from time to time, to say, from reputable journals, like things coming from Sage to say, hey, here's some articles in this area, or did you know there's a special issue in yeah. whatever journal? That's fine. 
you know, obviously look at the publisher behind it. But yes, if you are getting the random emails that say, dear esteemed professor, doctor, something. Um, we are such and, a fan of your work in this field. That oh, yes. Don't work. Like we will publish your book and can you guest author something and we'll get it very quickly and da 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 da. Chances are that's coming from our predatory piece. So uh, look it up to your due diligence. It might just be a not so greatly worded marketing email from an OK journal, but chances are those ones that are really seeking to come out um, and get, get you to really apply to them. They more than likely are going to be on that predatory end. Even if it feels good being called an esteemed doctor. <laughs> Thank you all for answering those questions. So I'm just going to hand it over now to Jessica to say some final words. Thank you. So for all the questions that came in, just know that we will be following up with you directly. There are some great questions that came in. I know we answered some of them in our presentation today. Um, definitely register for future webinars. We'll have some great speakers, researchers, and panelists, um, much like the fantastic team we had today. So a very, very, very big thank you to Derek, Melissa, Lorian for all of your insightful tips and recommendations. We really appreciate your time. And thank you all for tuning in. We will see you for the next webinar.